Okay, this is Stu, number two in Back in the Day series of podcasts. I've got Bruce with me. G'day, Bruce. G'day, Stewie. How you going, mate? Oh, pretty good yourself. Oh, a bit chilly this morning, but uh, now that we're in the studio, it's nice and warm. It certainly is. So I just met a fellow Cronulla boy, and that's what we're here to talk about, back in the day. Back in the day. So, Cronulla. Well, uh, I was born in Barony Bay, which is just outside of Cronulla, I suppose, a 15-minute walk from the beaches. Uh, right on near Barony Bay, in a little grove called Rawson Parade in 1954. And for those of you who don't know, Cronulla is basically the most southern beach. town, beach in the uh, Or surf Sydney beach, area. yeah. Um, Half of and sort of places. National Park and it's considered South Coast New South Wales. Mm, exactly. Um, so I was born in 54. I was the youngest of four. My father met my mother in the war, the big one, WW2. I don't know if anyone remembers that. You, Stuart, you were there. You had your yeah, head blow, blown off in Burma. Yeah. Um, and I they took photos on my mobile phone. Of the World War II? Yeah, when I was there, yeah. I oh, got right. plenty of them. They had mobile phones in yeah. World War II? Oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Must have missed that bit. Um, so they were what? I suppose um, early settlers of the Cronulla area. And Cronulla back then, it was nothing, nothing like it is now. It was the worst place on God's earth to live. Hours from uh, Sydney, too much sand, too much wind. So the old man bought the place, oh, God, 40... 46, I suppose, 48 maybe, or maybe a bit later, for 54 guineas, which was probably about 100 and something pound, probably 200 pound maybe. Uh, double, big double block. We had pigs, chickens. Our backyard ran down to the creek that ran into Barony Bay. Uh, we lived in the garage, which was just like a normal car garage. Nothing like these garages now. So that was how many people live in the garage? Six. Six people live in the garage. Yeah, we, the kids had a corner each, and I was the youngest, so Sean had the best corner. And the poor old car was... Uh, oh, we didn't have a car then. Out in the, oh, really? No. Okay. <laughs> Our mum and dad lived in what was the laundry... Did, uh, did, they had a bedroom off that. Did the train come from Sydney? Yeah, yeah, to, the train stopped all the then? way, yeah. Okay. Oh, well, basically, yeah, all the stations were still there. I don't think maybe Woolaware was there, which is stopped between Carrying Bar and Cronulla. But Como, all the way from Hurstville, Central, blah, 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 blah. So you did have access to the town, but there was no reason to go to town. Yeah. Okay. Everything happened in Cronulla, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just a really good era to grow up in, especially my era. Okay, so um, you, you started surfing... Well, my... Um, oh, a longboard, a yeah. longboard, okay. My elder sister, Sean, was a bit of a beach blanket bingo. Uh, she had a boyfriend called Brian who was a little bit of a, I um, don't know if people remember, but Adventures in Paradise. It was about a guy that sold the Pacific Islands. Ruggedly handsome, had a hand-carved tiki around his neck. Huh. And Brian had a hand-carved tiki made out of greenstone, you know, the New oh, Zealand yeah. stone. Yep, yep, yep. And incredibly dark and mysterious and attractive. Not to me, to Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I didn't mind him. Um, so Mum used me as a bit of a chastity belt. So because... Uh, Brian was a surfer and surfers back then were considered what they were when I sort of joined the tribe. Troublemakers? Um, no, just d danced to a different drummer. Yep. Okay. Um, but, you know, they all worked back then too. There's no dole. So mum used to send me down the beach with Sean and Brian and Brian had a whole mate, a bunch, a bunch of mates that uh, mainly hung and wander but surfed around uh, like Green Hills and Cornell Point, uh, Cornell Reefs. So, you know, they had the old surf wagons and stuff. So they'd sort of got me into the shore break and gave me a vague idea of how to wheel this thing that was, you know, 13 foot long, no leg rope, weighed a tonne, one skeg. Um, and then when I was drowning in the, for in the shore, shore break, they were up in the hills, sand hills, a, um, counting pubic hairs, probably. The sorts of things people did not do out of wedlock in the 60s. Well, when the pill... Well, they used to. Like, I remember reading my father's diary when he was in the war in early 40s and stuff, and uh, he went AWOL three times, chasing girls. He was going to convert to Catholicism, or whatever the word is. Catholicism. That's the word, thank yeah. you. Um, because, well, you know, especially in the war, they, you know, they never knew if they'd see each other again. Yeah, yeah. So it was wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. See you later, alligator. Okay. But that was, you know, all kept under the... So their, their peer group got me into surfing because they wanted to get rid of me. Okay. So I lumbered around um, with a longboard till about the early, late 60s. And, it, well, we used to live in the Sandhills and there was also a board 
place where you're in, um, I think it was Sorrell Street, you could leave your board, I think, for a penny or something like that. Um, you could just pick it up in the morning so you didn't have to lug it down from your okay, dollar's so bar like or whatever. A, 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 like a house with a dude's garage? Uh, thing, well, it used to be a house back in the day and then okay. eventually it turned into a, one of Cronulla's first Chinese restaurants. So it was just like a, basically yeah, a house that was yeah. sort of spitting distance from South Cronulla and Cronulla Point. And the guy just turned it into a, a really minor surf shop. Okay. He shaped boards out the back, but they were all long boards. And for a couple of pennies or whatever it was, you could leave your board there. But it was mainly for uh, okay. guys from Hurstful and places like that who had to catch the train in. Yep. Of course, the boards were so big you couldn't fit them on the train. So then in the, uh, yeah, about 68, I think it was, um, a guy that was, um, like, we were riding cool lights and, and, um, and pippos. They were sort of like uh, boogie boards made out of fiberglass. Okay. So a mate went up the north coast and ran into George Greeno. And Greeno was riding spoons in that era, I believe. You know, the yep, fiberglass yep. rim and rails and foam uh, uh, foam rails and plastic, uh, fiberglass deck. Um, and he brought back a board that he made with Greeno, just a slab. So he made like a surfboard, a really short surfboard, uh, square tail, round nose. And that was my first kneeboard. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And on the first time I had a go at this board, I got tubed. I went, well, bugger this standing up. Okay. And I haven't gone backwards yet. I'm still a cripple. <laughs> so it was a very, um, very tolerant time. You know, because surfing had been around, you know, since the 40s, I suppose, or whatever, the late 50s, easy. But a lot of the surfers who, they weren't, they were all workers. So they were all, and they were all football players. Yep. So I started playing football for Corral RSL, Return Servicemen's League. Of course, the old man got us in. I started playing football for them when I was six. So, and I was in the surf club, uh, North Cronulla Surf Club. And That's by football, Nippa. we're talking rugby league. Oh, yeah, rugby league, sorry. So a lot of guys that were above us, our, our um, mentors, were either the old, really old blokes that were in the surf club and the football club were return servicemen. Okay. So they're all ex Changi guys, all commandos that had gone all through India, um, ch- you know, Indonesia and Burma and Malaya and all that sort of thing. And then my old man was in the Air Force, so a lot of his mates. So everyone in the whole area lived in their garage, and when they got a few bob in, they put a, a few... bit more in the house. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So, okay, let's jump forward. Dun, 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 dun. To, uh, okay, so we finish high school. Oh, finish we, high school. We live, our, we live our childhood life. Oh, bliss, nice. yeah, Bodie Bay Primary like, School. How, like, how old were you when you moved into the house? Oh, I was probably... F- Five. Okay. So it would have been 1969. Okay. Oh, no, 1959. 1959. Yeah. Okay. But it wasn't the house that we had. He was an architect, so it was a pretty groovy house. So then went to primary school, high school, left high school in 1972. Okay. Yeah. Uh, many wild stories at high school, but it was uh, walking distance to the beach. Or well, not walking distance, but jigging distance. Yep. So we used to sign in on the morning and leave, come home, or well, back to school by 3.30 for roll call with wet school pants. <laughs> and my whole, all my family went to the same high school. So it was quite funny. And lots of experiences, girls, you know, your first kiss, all that jazz, and a bit more. I didn't think kiss came on the scene until the 70s. Different kind of kiss. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, more like the French letter. <laughs> I mean, the French letter. Uh, so then after high school, believe it or not, I joined the bank. Okay. I became a bank teller at the rural bank. Yeah, it was a rural bank, yeah. So, first of all, I went to Hurstville. Yep. Uh, did my teller school, became a teller at Hurstville. Then the uh, boss took me aside and said, uh, Bruce, you're not really suitable for bank material. We think you're on something, which I was. Uh, so they sent me to Sutherland as a sort of probation. Okay. And then the terrible thing in Sutherland was it was the fifth and sixth form for the Catholic girls' school. So I knew a lot of friends from the area. So mm, that was probably not the best area to send me. So we used to go out at lunchtime and misbehave and then take the rest of the afternoon off. So they eventually sacked me from the bank and I went to East Sydney Tech and did hotel motel management. Okay. Got a degree in that. So managing bars and cookery and blah, 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 blah. So you were crim- commuting from Cronulla to the city? Yeah. To oh, no, no. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Central, yeah. East Sydney. Yep. Yeah. Okay. With my briefcase full of um, chef knives and my little cookery uniform, and <laughs> they covered all aspects of the hospitality trade: bookkeeping, okay. butchery, wow. mixing cocktails. That was good. I bet they don't do 
course like that now. Um, I think they still do, but they oh, probably okay. concentrate on particular types of, you know, cake making yep. or soup making or sauce making. But they covered everything from bookkeeping right through the butchery, uh, cooking in the kitchen, running a commercial kitchen, running a commercial hotel. But the best one was um, cocktail class. Okay. So you'd make these beautiful cocktails and a few other things that were quite popular around that era. Um, and you could either pour them down the sink or you could drink them. So they were probably classes of six. So probably four people would drink them, and so you'd get to share all the ones that didn't pour them down the sink. Okay. We'd drink them. So you'd trot off to butchery, a bit ooh la la <laughs> <laughs> So I lasted there for uh, four years, got my diploma, um, and then went working in hotels back to Cronulla. So my first job in Cronulla was at Cronulla RSL, which overlooked okay. Cronulla Point. Yep. which I played football for. I was still a hooker for them. Okay. And I don't mean hang around the cross in uh, high heels. <laughs> I mean rugby league hooker. Uh, so I worked there for probably two years, and then I went to Carimbar Hotel, which turned out to be quite a, a, a big rock and roll uh, venue. And is this where you kind of first discovered um, music? Oh, no, no. I discovered music through Sean, my sister. Okay, through your sister. She was right into the Beatles and uh, the Stones and... Stacked up at 45s, you know, okay. back in the day. And she used to buy a lot of records. So Buddy Holly, Johnny O'Keefe, yep. uh, Roy, o Roy Orbison. So you didn't go and see the Beatles? No, no, my no. sister did. Okay. No, my mother wouldn't let me. Okay. I was too young. Right. That's, that was, was the same with me and Kiss in 1982. Oh, well, I'm my glad mother my mother didn't let me. let me go to see Kiss. <laughs> 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 Nothing against them. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, my sister was, was a, probably the, the one that broke all the ground for me as far as the surfing and music. Yep. And being quite alternative in that era, yep. which was, you know, fooling around with boys. So, yeah, music started with my sister. Yep. We, we used to dance around the house with her 45s and stuff. Okay. And then my father was very musical. Playing on the gramophone? Yeah, on the gramophone, the three in one. <laughs> yeah. The, the no, 78s well, the and the. Radiogram. The radiogram. Yeah. yeah <laughs> the, it was the biggest piece of furniture in the house. Yeah, yeah. We used to have one as well when I was a kid, but it was forever not working because the needle of the record oh, was yeah, yeah. rooted in the. Yeah, they were a totally different concept there. Yeah, and then I think my dad tried to plug his electric guitar into it once and oh, blew the speakers. Amp. <laughs> 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 yeah, the old Phillips room one, they were. Yeah. But they were um, a real um, financial, it was like buying your first TV. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Duncan and Bain was a shop up at uh, Carrying Bar. We used to walk up when TV first came out and just look outside the window. And the, the, I think TV finished at, I think it was either 9 o'clock or 6 o'clock. I think it went for like 9 in the morning till maybe 9 at night or 6 at night. And we'd all go up as a family and just stand outside the window. Like Bart hangs out at, you know, at, at really? uh, yeah, and just stare at the TV. And it's it was like in black and white. The Cronulla equivalent of going to the drive-in. <laughs> oh, we had, drive -in. Drive no, we had a drive-in. No, we had a drive-in of a, uh, in Carimbar in, Tan in Tarrant Point. Okay. We eventually moved into a house yeah, just around the corner. Tarrant Point. No, oh, I think it was a Chirola. It's yeah. been there for quite, like, well, was, the, yeah, like yeah. It lasted for decades. The 80s, and I think like, the land was so expensive that yeah. they turned it into markets and they knocked it down and put, uh, a Cummings or a... Like you know. basically every drive-in that used to be in Sydney. Mm. Oh, I remember the old man used to make us all get in the back in the boot. We had a Vauxhall, I think the back seat folded down from the boot. And I think the drive-in would have been a couple of shillings, maybe. Okay. You know, maybe sixpence for a kid. Yep. But we had four kids and, you know, two two shillings. Yep. Or four, yeah, four sixpences, yeah, that was two shillings. That was a lot of money. That was a... So mum and dad would pay and then he'd, we'd all get out, climb out into the boot and drive in. And then you just push the back seat right out, and all of a sudden there were six people in the car. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the music here, especially at school, there was a lot of music, a lot of guys that, uh, well, they didn't surf, basically. They were just music people. Yeah. Uh, and so there was a lot of guys playing music around the area. Yep. And so it was basically, there was no, there was no rule like sports fanatics at our okay. school. It was just either surfing music. So there wasn't any real clicks. So for instance... Do you remember the first time you heard Sergeant Peppers? Uh, yeah, my sister like had it. mind blown from... Um, no, I think I was probably a bit young. Okay. So what was that? Probably 62? Oh, we'll have a look on the computer. That's why I've got it all ready to go. Let's have a look. Like a lot of the Beatles back then was uh, radio, so it was all Hold My Hand, Love, Love Me Do. Yep. They were good songs, uh, but they weren't the sort of thing we were searching out. And even, you know, like Rubber Soul and... Let's have a look. I think we're probably 63, maybe. 67. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, crikey. On 26 May 1967. Oh, you're kidding me. Really? Yeah. Oh, well. 
I uh, know uh, Frank Zappa impressed me first of all. I think uh, Freak Out his first album. So did your your sister turn you on to Frank? No, Zappa? no, 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 mate. Okay, yeah. Uh, who turned me on to Velvet Underground and. Um, I think because a lot of people of my age had older sisters and brothers, <coughs> excuse me, um, and they didn't go for the two SM two UW format, which was yep. just basically the top forty AM radio. Uh, ah, yeah, 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 back yeah, then, yeah. no yeah. FM. Yeah, I think it was the Triple J was the first FM station I ever heard, or Double J. Uh, no, so no, Double J was um, AM. It, it it became Triple J. Oh, that's right. Yeah, FM. when it went FM. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Doug, uh, Doug. Oh, and Oliver Brockman and all those guys. Doug Murray was on. Oh, wasn't no, he on that one? Don't think you know. He was on. Know, he was on uh, yeah, I think he was a bit of a, a shaker and mover down in Melbourne. Yeah. But because we, especially when we were still at school, we couldn't go to pubs and we weren't really drinkers. So we'd go around to people's houses. So Elizabeth had a pool table, blah, 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 to upstairs sort of area, so you could just take it over. Yep. And her two sisters, Rebecca and Catherine, I had really good taste in music. They had a really good um, stereo. Yep. So you could just sit up there and have a few Bob Marley and on-fielders and play pool and listen to their record collection. So it was like, you know, Chain and uh, Jeff Rad Tull and Moody so Blues. where and, are we looking here? Like late 60s or early 70s? Yeah, but late 60s, like 68, 69, 70, 71. So I was still at high school. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And Elizabeth was two years younger than me. And, and she was a girl when I was in the bank. When they sent me to Sutherland, she was going to Sutherland Girls School, the Catholic school there. Okay. And Kerrick and uh, a few other. So they didn't lead me down the garden path, but I already knew them from a young age. Yep. So it was quite easy to connect with them. And because they had a whole bunch of different friends, because they went to a Catholic school, yep. and they were all girls. And you know what Frank says about Catholic girls? No. Oh, well, <laughs> I won't repeat it then. I but, know Red Hot Chili Papers say Catholic school girls rule. Rule, do that? Yeah, I think that was one on one of their early early albums. Yeah, oh, yeah, not um, mo- uh, Mother's yeah. Milk. Um, hang on. No, well, Frank says anyway. Frank says a lot of things about girls, but Catholic. They were very keen to um. Um. <laughs> Go elves and orgasms. Yep, yep, it's a, that's a Red Hot Chili Peppers track. Oh, yeah, off Mother's Milk? Um, no, off Freaky Styly. Oh, yeah, their funky yep. one. Yeah. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah, so that that really allowed... And because I had older sisters, um, and again, a, a lot of the socialising was at home because everyone was underage. Oh, OK. And plus that era, like my sisters used to go out in miniskirts, and the old man used to hit the roof, so Sean and Robin learnt that they went out dressed with my parents' as, um limits and then they'd ever go to the park and have clothes stashed there or stashed at a girlfriend's house. Yep, and change. But, yeah, <laughs> until Shay and come home one night, probably a little bit tipsy and forgot to change from her miniskirt. Ah, oh, okay. And, uh, you know, whatever. So um, yeah, I was yeah. lucky I had older sisters yep. and a lady, a female friend, so when I started to think completely different about females, I was quite, not at ease with them, yep. but I'd spent a lot of time around yeah, them, so yeah, if yeah. I had grown up in a single boy family or whatever... Yep. Much like today, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, my music started quite early. So Jackson 5, too, things like okay. that, yeah. yeah. But the Beatles, my sister was very keen on. But for some strange reason, because a lot of it was on the radio, and I don't want to sound like I was... What's that word when you think, oh, well, you know, I listened to that, but I had something better going on. There were things like the Velvet Underground and Zappa and... Um, it you know, obviously wasn't being played on the radio. Well, no, no, yeah. not at all, yeah. no. But mates had it, or mates' yep. brothers. So you'd go around, you know, your jig school or something, or you'd go around on a Friday night, and you'd have to be home by 9 o'clock or something. And were, you like, were people making tapes for each other back then? Like tape um, well, the tapes weren't real big at all, because okay. I don't think, you know, like tape decks and things like that were really popular. Okay. So it was all yeah, vinyl. Okay. Uh, 45s were really popular for a while, then they dropped out. Okay. But, like you just know, like seven-inch ones? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they would have only been like... A, like less than a dollar each. Oh, then, mate, yeah. Well, back then, they, were, they weren't even that because it was still, well, six, up to 66, it was shillings and pence. Yeah. So I think the first couple of albums I bought from Glass Onion, which was a record store in Cronulla, okay. run by Kenny Porter. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, you'd get it at Duncan and Baines and McDonald, uh, McDowell's and shops like that used to have a music uh, section. Uh, they were like a dollar fifty or a dollar ninety for a full-size album. Oh, my God. Yeah. I've oh. still got records with stickers on them at five ninety nine. Wow. Yeah. 
So music started, um, and my family used to, you know, like mum and dad, they'd get on the turps around Christmas with the neighbours and stuff and get out the big Crosby and Perry Como and yep. dance away. So we were always young and sort of put to bed or whatever or given a glass of lemonade and told to get out the back. Yep. But uh, it was always a big part because TV wasn't that good in those days. Yeah, right. Yeah. Reception but, and programming. Well, yeah, content. But then again, we had, you know, like Bandstand. Yep. And um, Six O'Clock Rock, that was uh, yeah. Johnny O'Keefe, I think, and Brian Henderson, of all people, who became the newsreader, and the old dude. Yeah, he yeah. He was on um, yeah, What's Crafted to You is Rangoon to Me. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, so let's sort of skip a little bit forward again to the 70s and, like, some of the... Uh, who was the first band that you saw? Live? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tarrant Point uh, was a big football field where they used to play football. I um, mean, it was sort of like a youth centre, so I saw the yeah. Lardy Dars... I think it was, um, and that I think that was a Friday every month, and we used to hitch down because it was a bit. It wasn't that far from our place, but it was a bit. So further. it wasn't a licensed venue. It was like oh no 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 alcohol. Just... yeah uh, well no yeah. alcohol whatsoever okay yeah but there are plenty of the other one. But I, I imagine like much like in my day of the blue light discos, people would preload as yeah. they call it these days. Oh no, um, we didn't drink. Okay. believe it or not. Okay. Ah, uh, no, alcohol was for the squares. But you used to smoke weed? Yeah. Okay. And a few other things as well. Uh, but yeah, so it would have been at Tarrant Point, probably a youth centre. Okay. So I'm pretty sure it was Wedding Saddington, either Chain or the Lady Dars, Black Feather, someone like that. Okay. But we, we saw a lot of music there. And then also one of the radio stations used to put on live concert at Ganamata Bay where the ferry, which was at, just at the, the bay side of Cronulla. Yeah, yeah. So that's where the ferry went to Royal National the Park. And Ganamata there was a, Bay. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah well, there's yeah. a big, you know, um, park, sort of gazebos everywhere. Yep. So I think it was either maybe 2U, 2UE or maybe 2UW or maybe even Double J. And I saw Mother Goose... Um, oh, I remember more of the Yeah, they were New Zealand. Yeah, they dressed up as bees. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And the lead singer used to like <laughs> dress a bit like Donald Duck. Yeah, or like, a bee. They they were they were like yeah. split ends when split ends first came out. Yeah, they dressed, yeah. and we saw split ends there. I think we saw people like Lobby Lloyd, and um, and it was all free. Yeah, and right. same was the one at Tarrant Point. Okay. So that that was all Australian music. So the local. But there was a lot of uh, leftover sort of stuff from like the late sixties, so like Cold Joy yeah. and um, Little Patty. Yeah, well, I d yeah, not yeah, Little Patty. Yeah, well, she, you know, if you were a surfer, you had to know your little Patty. Yeah, right. And you know, ride the what is it? Walk the plank. The stomp. The, oh yeah, the, the stomp. stomp. Yeah, well, that was more my sister's era. So, um, what was the first international band you saw? Oh, probably Zappa or Santana. Okay, and where would that have been? So uh, Horn and Pavilion. Okay. Yeah, I saw Zappa in seventy two. Okay. And some idiot led off a Roman candle in the Horton Pavilion, and we were totally um, out to lunch. And how, and how did Zappa respond? Oh, to Zappa that? freaked out. And don't, there's a song called, um, oh, it's about Marjorie. Emmy's her, um, it's on, I think it's on uh, Zuta Lewis or something like that. And Zappa had already, that smoke on the water, you know, the deep purple one. Yep. Zappa's, all of Zappa's gear burnt down at Montreux or Montreux, that oh, festival okay, they were yeah, at. Right, that, yeah. That's what Smoke on the Water is about. Yeah. So okay. Zappa was really freaked out about in indoor venues going oh, up okay. and because he lost all of his stage gear in, yep. in Switzerland and Zappa just freaked. But there was a lot of guy, people on acid and when this guy let the uh, Roman candle off, <laughs> it just freaked out a lot of people. Oh, and yeah. the guys in the white uniforms, the usherettes, came and carried a few people out. It was just like, blew their mind. Uh, Zappa's totally straight edge, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah. it's amazing. His hardest somebody... um, stimulant is coffee and cigarettes. Yeah, right. It's amazing that how somebody who's so straight edge can yeah, can do such so wild trippers. music. But see, his band, the Mother of His Invention, and Captain Beefheart, and and people that he collaborated with, were notorious, you know, oh, okay. out there. Yeah. Okay. I I saw an interview with Gibby Hayes. Oh yeah, the butthole, butthole surface. Yeah. yeah. And and he was saying he he really regrets being so wasted. Oh, well, we saw the, uh, the Butthole Surface quite a bit uh, oh, in Melbourne. Yeah, there was, a, I think it was a Greek play, uh, the Greek theatre or something. And we saw, yeah, it was that Pepper tour, you know, that oh, one yeah, that was yeah, really yeah. big. Okay. It was before they took the piss out of Led Zeppelin. And you really couldn't tell, uh, Gibby Hayes was, he had this like really long blonde hair and the guitarist was just brilliant. And like really psychedelic, heavy hallucinogenic light show and they were just wild and loud 
and we saw them three times in that tour, and they were just, they were just different. Okay. You know, the sort of thing. Like, there was wild rock bands, but there weren't guys that were sort of, like, totally... Like, when we saw Sonic Youth, they were the same sort of, like, really extreme music, very minimal light show or stage presence, but, like, really great uh, sound and... Yeah, right. Yeah. So, let's go back to the 70s. At some point in the 70s, as far as I've read and heard, um, like, all the marijuana disappeared... Yeah, yeah, I'm afraid so. Yeah, Buddha sticks disappeared, all that sort of thing. And heroin became incredibly potent. Oh, it was potent. And that was from Mr. Asia. Okay. Uh, Terry Clark, I think it was. It was a New Zealand guy. Yep. When he first, his first uh, ever drug run was Buddha sticks. And yep. I think he made something like $10 million. Like it was on that underbelly. There's a oh, whole, yeah, there's a whole underbelly yeah. series about him. And, and, and he realised that, like, oh, Buddha sticks, they take up too much space. Yeah, if I bring so this why? stuff yeah, called heroin yeah, in, yeah, exactly. it takes up he- heaps less space. And yeah, from what I read, it's. Or from what I've heard and read, it's like people would go around to their person to get their, yeah, their get weed, and it's like, oh, look, we bit. don't have any weed, but we've got this. And it's bullshit, You're the first crap. one's for free. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, and, and now it sounds very naive now, and I think Rabbit said it, or Peter, Peter oh, yeah, Rabbit said it in one of his books. We're talking about Wayne Rabbit, oh, Parker, sorry, yeah, the Australian yeah. surfer of the and Michael 70s. And Michael Peterson, yep. when his era and that crew was yep. the same sort of era, and I'm putting myself in that kind of surfing elite. <laughs> But yeah, Cronulla was just flooded with uh, salt and pepper heroin. You could buy a, a gelatin capsule, you know, like a normal vitamin capsule, filled at the top for thirty dollars, and it was pure as fuck. And how and how long would that last? Like how many? Well, because we we were only using maybe once, maybe once a week. Okay. So it'll last you a long time, but after about six months of that, even once a week, you know, and because it was pure, you, yep. your dosage would go up. Okay. And then there was no needle exchange, so law, hepatitis and the law sharing of diminishing needles. returns. Yeah, but like and I know it sounds incredibly first. naive, but because they'd lied about marijuana and hashish, yep. that we found incredibly wonderful compared to what alcohol did to us and our friends. Yep. The aggression and the sickness, and you could have a the old puff at the old joint, and yep. you'd be laughing, or you know, you'd go to the pub and drink lemon squash all night, and still have a great night. I think that's kind of one of the one of the things that probably. The war on drugs is severely responsible for is, oh, yeah. is making people sort of assume that. Well, I've been told a lie about this. Why? Why? What's to say oh, yeah. that you're not lying about that? And like, it all both. And the harder drugs, where you know they generally do. Well, see, well, we uh, well when acid came in weed. as well too, which was before heroin. We, we certainly experienced with mushrooms and um, LSD and, and mescaline and things like that. Yep. So again, there seem to be. There, there was obviously a criminal element in it. Like when yeah. I worked at, um, I used to work in at Sydney at a, I got a spare time job and in, while I was still at school at a, a furniture factory. They made uh, furniture for schools. Okay. And there was a very vast mob of Lebanese people there. And there was knife fights every lunchtime. Oh but they they had all the connections in the hash world. Okay. And you'd go around to their houses in, you know, by the back of Whoop Whoop somewhere, you know, at Penrith or somewhere, you know, from Cronulla it was a trek. Yep. And mum and dad would be there. They couldn't speak a word of English. Um, the whole family, all the cousins and the aunties, they welcomed you into the house. Like, you, you were there to do a drug deal. <laughs> and they just about adopted you. You know, they fed you. <laughs> yeah. So, and the younger guys would, would sell you the dope. But when heroin came in, it was just a shocker. Okay. Because uh, a lot of people fell by the wire. So I know, well, three friends that are dead from it and two really good friends. And they, they died back then? Ah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, late seventies, early seventies. If you um to get a good sort of um, overview idea of what it was like back then, um, check out if you can Docs from space. Google it. Well, I was going to say puberty blues. Um, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah Kathy yeah. Lett or um, Monkey Grip. That was more Melbourne, but yeah, okay. It was just um, a very bohemian, all the hippie thing. Because we were surfers. Um. We we were alternative, but we were pretty straight in our lifestyle. We had long hair and you know things like that. But there was people coming into the community that were really you know that like you know living up in Nib- or, you know before Nimbin and all that. They yep. were living the alternative lifestyle before it was the red setter and the combi. Yeah. So already being involved in a music that was a little bit alternative and a drug scene that was already a little bit alternative, you met really different people that were either artists or yeah musicians or whatever so it really opens your um social set and the people you knew your peer group 
to maybe a great deal of different people if you just had been... And nothing wrong with being a bricklayer or going to the pub or watching the footy. Yep. But it really does limit the type of people that you get to meet, I would imagine. Yeah, right. Yeah. So the la- let's let's jump right, right forward. What's the last What's the last international act you saw? Uh, well, uh, Byron. Uh, well, Zappa or Zappa's son. Zappa's son. Yeah, okay, and so that was a festival. Byron, Byron yeah. Bay Blues Festival. Uh, before that, it was a Violent Femmes, and then before okay. that, it would have been John Cooper Clark, New Order. Okay. Um, the Cure, XTC. So, so you- I saw quite a lot of international bands because all of a sudden suburban pubs realised it was a mint to be made. You could get in for like two bucks fifty five dollars. Yeah. See XTC or the and, Cure, and this is before like um, the days of strict fire regulations and oh, stuff like sure. that. Oh, for sure, yeah, they'd serve you till you bloody vomited. Yeah, and really, really great nights, and the same at bands like Cole Chisel and uh, yep. Lobby Lloyd, and um, well, the Angels. When the Angels started, they were they were sort of like quite a punk band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I remember you seeing see the early like, footage of them on Countdown there. Well, bands like Radio Birdman and. Yep. Um, yeah, so did, we, you, did you ever go to that Radio Birdman venue they had on Oxford Street, the Oxford Circus or whatever they called it? Oh, I knew of it because okay. it was just around the corner from where I went to tech, but it was the Blue House back then, so it was people like um, oh, the guy that was involved with Luna Park, Martin Sharp, was oh, it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The Yellow House. Yeah. Um, a, and again, a very inner city, that, it was a very Mandrax heroine. Okay. It wasn't anything lighthearted, but really brilliant artists, really brilliant musicians. Yep. Uh, but the inner city, um, like I had a couple of mates that were private school guys, so they went to um, private schools in Sydney, and through their mates, they were introduced to a, a much more arty, maybe more of a Melbourne scene sort of thing. Okay. That you didn't have that healthy lifestyle going down to the beach. <laughs> Melbourne, man, it freaks me out, that place. It's just. Well, I moved to Melbourne after Tassie, and I found it brilliant. Well, the time that I spent living in Melbourne is like the most, ho- the hottest weather I've ever experienced, oh, really? and the coldest weather I've ever experienced. Oh, yeah. It was just, yeah, I don't know. Well, it, I found Tassie incredibly. Um, after I came back from overseas, you know, all the boys were still sitting around pulling bongs. I'd been gone like nearly eighteen months. Corella Point was going off, and no one wanted to know about it. Yeah, right, because everybody was out to lunch. Yeah, and on the you know smoking. Uh, well, that's what I mean, out to lunch on the gear, not out to yeah, lunch, exactly. having something to eat. Exactly, at, mate. At, yeah. at the and all they did was go and play the pokies and shit. Okay. Uh, guys, I grew up with surfing, so I had mates from high school that had gone down there, and Pete, another mate of mine from Cronulla, that I knew from like the North Cronulla Hotel, which is wild scene again, and the Cecil Hotel. Uh, we just went down there on the whim and. Um, Again, it was uh, a really vibrant art, music. Um, I'd learnt lead lighting, all that sort of jazz. Okay. And if you treated the women with half a decent um, bit of respect, it was peace, love, joy. Okay. <laughs> but then after the uh, new t- Tasmania, I moved to Melbourne, Greville Street, Paran, around there. And then. Um, yeah, that's kind of near where I was in Balaclava. Yeah, well, then we moved to Elson Wick, which was around the corner from Balaclava, Balaclava yeah, the ABC yeah. Studios. Then we moved to Port Melbourne, where all the painters and dockers drank. Okay. And then I moved up here, up to Jackie Bullman. Yep. Lived out in the bush for a while, but still had my 12-volt stereo, but a lot of it was tapes and CDs. Yep, yep. okay. But, so, yeah, you were saying the other day, uh, all your trawling through the internet, the amount of music that's out there at your fingertips now, and that's why I've been collecting all the older stuff now that it's available. I've been looking for Loaded by the Velvet Underground for 30, 40 years. And you got it? Yeah. Okay. Off uh, Amazon. Yeah, right. And the same with, like, uh, like I had a lot of the early Zappa on radio, uh, record. But, you know, some of the bands that you have played me, the, what are the Mod to Mods or something? Sleaford Mods. Oh, mate. Well, The Fall. And Amal you know? and the Sniffers. I'm loving them. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, loving. you saw The Fall, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See well, it. see, we also saw Fall the Carnes and Collectors and... Um, <laughs> it's all the birthday party. 90, yeah. 90, 91, maybe? Oh, I'd give me your left testicle to see The Fall. <laughs> And Marquis Smith has passed away last year, was it? Or yeah. was it this year? No, uh, I think it was like last year. Yeah. yeah. Well, live bands that really blew me out, New Order Live, which yeah. is brilliant. And they came out with John Cooper Clark. Oh, okay. And Alexi Sale. That must have been a different tour than the one I saw. Yeah. On. Well, John Cooper Clark, well, they, I think New, New Order went back home, or John Cooper Clark went back home. So I saw New Order to, uh, I saw them all over Sydney, and we were still living in Cronulla. So when we came back from Tassie. Uh, the Cure were brilliant. XTC were brilliant. And you saw the birthday party? Yeah, yeah. 
where were you when you saw the birthday party? I think it was uh, the Newport Arms or something like that, somewhere okay. over on the north side, or maybe okay. maybe it could have been the inner city venue. I'm not quite sure. It was pretty hazy, wazy days. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but without music, um, especially when you get a bit older, surfing's lovely, but you get a little bit uh, old and grey for it, and I don't think I've been out for an early for about a month. So it's, it's, with books and, and that style of things, I think, you know, it is really – and I, I poo hard the internet to the cows come out. You know, I'm a rural lad. But it got you, it got you your um, Velvet Underground well, CD exactly, that you've been exactly. chasing. Exactly, and some of the stuff yeah. that you've put up. And, you know, we saw the um, unknown comic again the other day. Yeah, yeah. You know, with the paper bag on his head. <laughs> yeah. So I only sort of poo hard it because I'm ignorant of it. I'm a bit of a Luddite. But, you know, associating with you over the years, uh, that you're my Welsh relative, nudge, nudge. We, that's a funny story, isn't it? Yeah, me and Bruce are actually kind of related in a in a sort of bizarre kind of way. Yeah, Bruce nothing has been sort of um... coming around and hanging out at my place for a while, saying good day and just socialising. Oh, and we then used to know each other from the surf. Too. Yeah, yeah, from the surf. And um, one day, Bruce, I had a Welsh flag up on my thing because my dad's Welsh. Cut a long story <laughs> short, Bruce's auntie, his mum's sister, married my dad's father's brother. Yeah. I was just like... Oh so when God, you said your surname was... Well, I won't mention your surname in quite you want to keep that or amenity yeah. or whatever the word is. Yeah, but... And I said, oh, that's my... Um, my auntie's maiden, uh, married name. Yeah. <laughs> oh, isn't that funny? Oh, where, and then where my, are they from? And you my said dad's Anglesey. uncle is the, has the same name as my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are you, t- what are you talking <laughs> about? My dad married my mum. <laughs> <laughs> but when Auntie Margaret used to come to visit us at Cronulla, she'd also go and visit your family... Yep. At different areas, and then when you went over to Wales and visited them, yep, and it was just so uh, it looked it took like four hour, four years for the penny to drop, didn't it, or something like that? Uh, probably four or five, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just you know, I mean, we live in a small town, and it's not uncommon for people to be related or distantly related within the town, <laughs> but for us to kind of be related by marriage from the other yeah. side of the world, by none, and be in no this small doing town, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's beyond. But it, it's funny talking to Pete here at the station this morning. He's a Cronulla boy, babe, probably yep. uh, 60 in his late 60s now. I'm in the sort of mid-60s. And uh, the era he was talking of is the era my sister was involved in. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's funny how the everyone has back in the day, you know, the, the worm does turn. Yeah. And I think that's the interesting thing about this show, not me, but people you have on. And they can, like when I did Mills on Wheels, you'd talk to these people and you'd have this preconceived idea that they were old and they'd had their, they didn't even have their moment in the sun. Yep. And then when you talk to them, you know, they talk about the pre pre war. Yep. You know, after World War One, the depression. Yep. And then you know, growing up, you were showing me those old photos on the internet the other night. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the, the whole premise of me doing this is to kind of, um, you know, you can you can do a Google search, Google image search, and 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 find any random picture from any point in time since photography was invented and and Flash i just bang. figure we've got the we've got the technology to be able to do uh oral yeah, orally verbally so yeah that's that's kind of the whole basis on but on that what this is all about. me of the slums around um, paddington and Belmain. So, those houses are worth yeah. millions now oh i know and right in the corner of one of the photos was two little girls you know and a really flimsy like it looked like they had sugar sacks on no yep. shoes yep and it was 18 people to two bedrooms. Yep. And now it's million dollar area. Yeah, I know. Multi million dollar yeah. area. Yeah. Like, I mean, when I lived in the inner city in early 90s, the cheapest place you could buy would have been a one or two bedroom terrace that would have been close to derelict and it would have been like 300,000. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, when I first moved to Hobart, you could get a, like a really nice wrought iron two story, you know, all the houses they had in Paddington and Balmain. One major ho- yeah. uh, hallway. Terrace or brownstone style, as they well, call it yeah. in America. Well, 30 grand. And yeah. you could see the bay, see all around Hobart. Oh, Tasmania is worth heaps. It's like, worth now. Hobart yeah, I'm talking about ridiculous. 1980. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. But the uh, same with Cronulla, you know. Like beach blocks in Cronulla when I was 17 were probably probably $80,000. Which is, You know, you don't think about things, those things when you're 18, 19. Yeah. Yeah. You want to go out and rock and roll and party and how does put, Kiss put it? Rock ah. and roll all night and, <laughs> and party. Oh, every day. I'd never thought I'd seen, be quoting Kiss the, on radio. Have you seen the Family Guy? Have you? Do you see ever yeah, seen the, the family? Crown Jewels? Oh, cra- the Family. Oh, yeah, Family yeah, Guy. That have you? Classic. There's one where he takes his wife to a Kiss concert. Oh, really? And 
um, she's dressed up as Peter Chris and he's dressed up as Jean. Oh, and right. they're at the front and they're singing rock and roll all night. And, and Paul Stanley puts the microphone down to her and she, she doesn't know what the words are. And have, oh. have a real good time. <laughs> and, <laughs> but isn't it funny how people can gauge their youth by those shows? Yeah, yeah. Like you speak to people now about uh, South Park and uh, American Dad and... Yep, yep. Well, and so, so when I first started watching The Simpsons, Homer was old enough to be my dad. Now I'm watching The Simpsons, and Homer is younger than me, and oh, he's still right. younger yeah, than yeah, me. He's yeah. like in his late thirties. See, that, that's the beauty of the South Park guys, and also I think it was you or someone saying about um, the League of Gentlemen. There's humour now that has become mainstream. It used to be so out there, like the goons and Monty Python back in out my day. Yeah, and I don't know what it was in your day, but that was pretty alternative. My day, I guess like you'd say like ostentatious, Rodney, oh, yeah, Rodney yeah. Rude. But that yeah, um, that was pretty brilliant stuff. The Twelfth Man, all yeah. those. Things the guy that used to do, but the they were country. really commenting, and that was a brilliant. The Rude album, yeah, yeah. Doug Murray, Ken Sterling, yeah. But they were. That was when Australia was developing as a nation, bit movies and art. Yeah. But our comedy wasn't ripping off the British, like Monty Python. No, right? well, it was really Australian and based. Yeah, like during the seventies, like um, British comedy was really. Benny Hill, Carry, oh, yeah, carry yeah. On, sort of real sort But there of was still a lot of um, fringe stuff. Yeah. But yeah, it was more late 60s, I suppose. The goodies. Yeah. But now we've got, you know, like Housos and... Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess what, we've probably developed more of an ability to laugh at ourselves. Well, I think we always, always did. And that was one of the best things about being Australian. Because American humour always seemed like the Free Stooges or whatever. It was laughing at someone, yeah, yeah. their pain. Whereas yeah. the British and the Australian humour... Was you're all in it together, sort of thing. See, like, it's never yeah, alienated. yeah, I agree with you, but I, I think, like, yep, that's that's the American sort of humour, and then the British humour was like Benny Hill, like laughing mm. at a girl with like big boob, boobs, yeah. big boobs, and and then yeah, I don't know. Australian so I don't know if it's that larrikin spirit or whatever, you know. But you see, your really old Australian movies like The Sundowner, they've been playing them on TV a lot, and you know because they don't want to spend money on new things. Yep. And that whole riding the sheep's back, you know, and the wall for the country and how big it was, and blah 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 blah. And that that really never made an impression upon me, that whole Australiana and the riots and oi, the oi, the oi, oi, oi. No, the, the most impression any of that made on me was when I was in the UK in 1986, and it was around the time the first space shuttle exploded. Oh, right. NASA needs I another was, seven astronauts. I was up really late, and there was that Australian movie, I think it was called Jetta. Oh, yeah. The yeah, one about yeah, the Aboriginal yeah, yeah, girl? The Aboriginal girl. Yeah, yeah, and it was like, oh, wow. And I would never even knew that it existed. Oh, really? I was like 16 years old at the time. I'm like, what is yeah. this? No, that was a very sort of heavy movie. It yeah, yeah. Really dealing with what, what was actually going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And speaking of old movies, I think it was the first movie made in, I don't know, but 101 Horsemen. It was made out of the Sandhills at Wanda. Oh, okay. When we, when we did have Sandhills. Oh, it's the first Australian movie in colour. Yeah, I don't know if it was in colour or one of the first. It was one of the first, maybe, Cinemascope or something like that. Okay. But it was out of the Chips Rapidy days and all that sort of thing. But, yeah, yeah it's funny how the um, idea of Australia's changed. You know, Paul Hogan yeah. put a shrimp on the barbie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but I've also read that comedians are hating this point in time. Well, they were this hating this point in time until, until, until Donald Trump became oh, yeah, president yeah. because then Donald Trump's given them plenty of fodder to... To, to use for the committee. Like, but really like, mainstream. Like Sean McAuliffe, uh, Charlie Pickering. Yeah. Uh, who's the guy that does hard chat? Ball bloke. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, like they really yeah. go for the juggler vein, and they're really, really... And a lot of that stuff on Viceland. Yeah, you know, yeah, the TV yeah, show yeah, yeah. On yeah. SBS. They're no longer... They really do ask hard questions and make it humorous, and they're not taking the piss. They're, they're using, well, you, you're saying this, and yeah. don't you find that it's rather... Uh, yeah, yeah. Obscure or funny that you're time to chat hard. <laughs> hey, we're gonna have a break, and um, yeah, to the listeners, it'll seem like a split second, but we're gonna go out and um, have a cup of coffee, and um, yeah, I'm gonna stretch my ego. Yes, okay, okay, so we're back. We've been to the toilet, we've had a cup of tea. I didn't go to the toilet, well, we I were did. sitting out in the sun, counting whales, enjoying the sunshine of Yamba. Yeah, it's uh. It's a pretty nice day for a winter's day. And now, may I drift it back to punk But that doesn't mean you should come here and live. No, no, (laughs) don't. It's got sharks and it's got a very bad... um, There's no bicycle paths, there's no internet access. No, yep, yep. And it's full of old hippies. Yep, yep. Speaking of old hippies, remember when punk came into your life, Stuart? 
Uh, and I don't mean those prison people that used to, you know, get passed around from cell to cell. I remember, I remember, um, I remember. seeing Molly play on Humdrum on Countdown, play oh, yeah. a, a, an excerpt of uh, some Sex Pistols saying that he would never have these people on the show. <laughs> but I've also seen plenty of interviews, and it's usually, I think it's with Steve Jones and Paul oh, cool. Cook. Yeah, they're drinking that, Fosters. Yeah, that Molly has a few. And then Malcolm McLaren's lurking in the background. Well, Malcolm McLaren stole most of, what was it? Uh, Bow Wow Wow and May the Adam and the Ants. Yep. yep. But he was a character, mate. He was a chancer. So, okay, the 70s are cruising by... Bruce is into Zappa. Still. Chain. No, 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 not the 70s. Zappa, Zappa, Zappa. Go betweens. Triffords, a lot of yeah. strain. Okay, okay. And then, and then sort of punk sort of got big. Um, so we had you heard the Ramones before the sort of pistols made sort of punk yeah, somehow I, notorious? Well, the first venture into that style of music was New York Dolls and okay. the, the pistols quoted a lot. And Malcolm McLaren had a lot to do with the New York Dolls. He went to the States yep. to try and force them to turn into a communist band. And they did an album when they were all dressed in red leather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was before. He, I think he came back from the States, opened up Sex, was it, the shop he had? Yeah. or and, No, well, it was called something else oh, before Oh, it was a that. rockabilly was like, shop. Let It Rock or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And it, like sold teddy Dumbo- boy yeah, yeah. jackets and all that sort of stuff. So maybe without Malcolm McLaren, a, a chancer like that, and the same with Jake Riviera and Stiff and um, some of the guy that... Found new order. What was his name? He died a couple of years back. Oh, Tony Wilson. Yeah, yeah, yep. yep. So they were music lovers, I think, and because they were sick and tired of the Eagles and Billy Joel, and nothing wrong with Genesis or Phil Collins or any of that jazz. Honest. Yeah, well, I, the, I think their impression was that it was basically disappearing up its own ass, the music yeah. scene, and so it needed to be slapped. But you know, the mullet and the flares all of a sudden turned into. You know, cropped haircut and thin jeans and pointy toed boots. And even though I was a bit, you know, studded belts. And of course, we're, we all are fish. We all want to follow a fashion trend and we all want to fit in with a peer group. Yep. But punk was so friendly. Like, there was a lot of, I don't, oh, well, probably there was a lot of alcohol involved in it. But it didn't matter what sort of gigs you went to, you could go on your flares and your long hair. And if you were up in the pit or dancing or enjoying the music, like when I saw Sonic Goof, and I'm not saying they're a punk band. But we saw them in the middle of um, Paran, and it was just so trendy. But when, but that would have been a while after punk sort of came Oh, for sure, that was in like the early eighties. Okay, yeah. But just the way that punk changed things, you know, and, and by reading British magazines, New Musical Express and Melody Maker and stuff like that, they were using really good um, journalists that really did describe the gig. Yep, and the characters, and it was so different than the gigs I was used to, yeah, you know, right. say Cold Chisel or whoever, you know. That, so that with was, the Birdman, Radio Birdman on the scene? Well, yeah, yeah. At that we time, saw them was that kind Paddington. Of after? Well, yeah, was that after the re- Pistols came through, that Birdman? Well, yeah, I wouldn't have gone to see the Birdman, instead of, but I didn't know about the Saints until they went to England, and okay. I'm stranded. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Must have been my... <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, Bruce is just... Hot dog. Yeah. Um, <coughs> coughing up his morning tea. Exactly. <laughs> Do you, oh, there's your drink down there. I'm not used to talking about myself. <laughs> <coughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, I just coughed up from your liver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're just recapping um, how... Punk coming on the scene sort of changed... Changed Bruce's and other people's perceptions of of um, what exactly music was. Like, I, I mean, from my point of view, because I was because I was a little bit younger. I, I know Iggy, <coughs> the, Iggy and the Stooges were around for quite a while. The Ramones were around for a couple of years before before the Pistols came out. Um, like, I don't like I, I don't kind of quite understand what the Pistols sort of role in the whole big picture was, other than perhaps making this music that had been around for a few years more mainstream? Is that... I think it was more the press they got. You know, Phil from okay. Fury, I'm um, on the Grundy show, you know, when he came across... The, was it Susie, the band, the girl out of Susie? Or was yeah, it Batman? Yeah, Woman? Apparently he was like a real sleaze oh, real to those sleaze. girls, and that's why they... And 
Paul Cook pulled him up. He said, you're a dirty effer, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So basically the guy, he was just like, you know, an old school BBC journalist, a yeah. radio guy. And he was pissed. As yeah. As like he oh, they were all really, pissed really back really in drunk that, like, But then again, you had John Peel and Pirate Radio, yeah. which was the same era. They were all promoting different style of music, but it wasn't uh, Gary Glitter or, you know, the basically, and nothing Fleetwood wrong with Mac that. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, was just consumable dross, you know. And yeah, Fleetwood Mac, when they came to Australia, they did, it was on the, at the end of Tusk. Yep, yep. And they spent millions and millions of dollars yeah, on yeah, cocaine yeah. and God knows what else. And Although I've had this conversation with a f- couple of friends of mine that the money that bands used to spend or record companies used to spend on, yeah, on a recording Peter, back yeah. then produced such better recordings than what those produced now. Oh, people like Nick Cohen, you know, with a birthday party. and Nick Cave. Well, no, no, Nick Cohen, the, rec- the producer in, oh, okay. in, in Melbourne. Oh, no, hang on, um... Well, not Nick Cohen, Tony? Tony Cohen, yeah. Tony Cohen, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's recently dad. just died. Mm. Yeah. But he was one of the instigators of going to a studio out of hours oh, okay. where it was cheap. Yep. And because he'd recorded the easy, or not the easy beats, but people that were popular yep. that made money back for the record company. Said he had a good ear for things. Yep. So they led, the, the record company would say, yeah, well, you know, during the dead hours you can do what you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if it wasn't for hit people like that, and it, a lot of the people involved then, they were actually musicians. Yeah, you know, yeah. They knew what was going with the tuning of the bass yeah, yeah, and yeah. fold back and, and stuff like that. They weren't just uh, people sat it in their gilded cage and said, okay, well, I'm the producer. Yep. Create. Here I am now, entertain us. <laughs> yeah, and Nirvana and things like that. You know, I know they're not punk, but the whole grunge thing, yeah, yeah. you know, Pearl Jam and that whole... You know, flannel at shirts and... Well, I think kind of Nirvana kind of consider themselves punk rock oh, for before sure. they were sort of labelled as But it killed grunge. Kurt, didn't it? The fame? Yeah. I don't think Courtney helped him. But it's just bizarre that we went from, like, really regulated... If your mum and dad didn't like it and the kids couldn't watch it on Countdown on a Sunday night in your jammies... But like you say, when Molly first heard about the pistols and then changed his tune, and that interview was just replayed on Classic County, oh, was Steve it? Cook and Paul Jones, and they're all just leaning up outside some venue drinking Fosters. Yeah, or out and Molly's the house. asking these really deep and meaningful yeah, questions. Uh, he was actually a pretty good interviewer. Oh, like, for sure. Yeah, and it's the same with um, have they played? Well, I, I, I know that they, I know they have, and you can see it on YouTube if you do a Google search. If you do a <laughs> search on YouTube of um, Iggy Pop Countdown. Mm. Right, it's just oh, absolutely board. fucking wild. Well, the it's, little thirteen-year-old just did his yeah. silver lame pants, no shirt, obviously on some Coco Pops. Oh, he was, looks like he was he was whacked. Oh, but you read about but the like, early you see Stooges him, gigs. You see him walking down the um like they've little, like, yeah, like platform a, thing. a platform aisle sort of yeah, part of the like stage a and like all, and, the, and the kids in the, the crowd are moving back stand around. Yeah. <laughs> and then when he gets to Molly, he flips out Molly under the chin. Yeah, and he falls out of his chair. Dog face. And then he's, like, talking about how David Bowie works for him. Yeah. Oh, well, they had a big falling out. And Bowie had a big falling out with Lou Reed, too. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it's just bizarre, that, especially people like Iggy, I think that, that whole was, American punk thing. I think that was just after him and Bowie went to Berlin to get off the heroin. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's like going to Iceland to stay away from the cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against Iceland. Um, I, but, I love Iggy. Seen him a couple of times. But if you had a known him about him and the Stooges, I never saw the Stooges, but I heard their music again yep. through Bob Bob Threefield, who gave me got me into uh, well, he got me into Dylan as well. Okay, but also the New York Dolls, the Stooges, uh, that really sort of um, it was just basically rock and roll. But another guy that uh, was Alex Harvey, who's a pommy guy, Ian Jury. Yeah, you yeah, know, they but... were all old school guys, yep. but they moved forward and and. Same with Dr. Feelgood. They were playing rock and roll, but it was different rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the the punk scene was just similar to that. They just, I speak lyrically, it changed. They were more commenting on the state of society. Yeah. And England during that period was absolutely up the creek. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it was, I suppose it was before Thatcher or during Thatcher or whatever. Well, I think it was kind of like it was up the creek for Thatcher to take it. Like the, oh, the rubbish sure. was the rubbish wasn't getting collected and all yeah, sorts of yeah. and there was rats in the streets, miners strikes, yeah. and, and, and they were being, being treated like the scum of the earth, and yep. they were the backbone of England. Yep, yep. But it, it's funny how you associate, and I suppose you could go right back to Woody Guthrie 
when society is starting to alienate people, what it's doing now all over the world. Yeah. People, music like, like the specials or, you know, inter- inter- um, racial bands. Yep. And that's always been around, dub and all that sort of jazz and Bob Marley and, you know, just because he was a smoker, he was a Rastafarian and they yep. believed in a fair shop for everyone. But he used to cop it from the press. Like Bob Marley, like people would interview him and like... Oh, yeah, just, he'd just be... A... They would just but... make him out because he <coughs> smoked weed and he was a Rasta, made him out to... Oh, he was they just some kind of... did not paint him in a good light. They, no, they no. tried to paint Where him... Where if they had interviewed, um, you know, Clive Shakespeare or Gary Glitter... Oh, yeah. It would have been, oh, you're fantastic, Gary, yeah. love your new single. Yeah, yeah. Which was absolutely, you know... And nothing with Cliff Richards. Yeah. You know, it's wide for sound and... And there's a time and a place for everything. And I think one of the terrible things I've been guilty of in the past and, and the present is judging people by their musical taste. Like you used to go to parties and you'd go through their record collection before CDs. Yeah. And you go, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, but if they had like, you know, uh, Cold Fact or Tim Buckley or, oh, hello, hello, we've got something in common here. <laughs> and I know that's judging a book by its cover. Yeah. But it's the same with the fashion movement that came in with punk. And... New, uh, new wave, you know, like Duran Duran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. But I, I mean, suppose, like, when Queen got canned at um, Sunbury. Yeah, yeah. And everyone wanted Billy Thorpe to play. Yeah, and, yeah suck more out, piss. Suck more piss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so Australian. <laughs> Isn't it just that? And, you know, the riots at Bathurst and, and yeah. it, that show, like, on SBS, Rivals... You know, oh, soccer and all yeah. that sort of jazz. It's funny how be it music or sport, something that takes uh, the masses' attention, yep. is really pivotal in making social change. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And yeah. I don't know whether it boils down to political type things, or, or or are they happy that it makes us all think that it's creating social change oh, well, when really again, we're actually yeah. being socially engineered? Oh, for sure. By dubious. Well, that's what Zappy used to say. You know, it's all been manipulated by Coca Cola. Yep. So the flares and the beads and San Francisco and wearing a flower in your hair and sitting in the dirt playing a bongo drink while shooting bad speed, um, it was a joke. It turned into Charlie Manson and yeah, Altmont yeah. and, uh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, and the same with punk. Yeah, they yeah. managed to make it homogenous and, yeah. you know, and, and well, watchable they, by the masses. They made it something that people like John Lydon wanted to disassociate oh, themselves sure. with. And they? he's still fighting against the pricks. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and it, when he left the Pistols and um, like some of the early Public Image albums, oh, which is brilliant. Yeah, but like when he, when he first well. left the Pistols, I th- I'm pretty sure Virgin Virgin Records sent him to Jamaica, oh, the, right, the West yeah. Indies, to to find Dumb reggae stuff, bands yeah. to sign up. Like on the on oh, the right, back of Bob, yeah, yeah. on the back of the fact that Bob Marley was getting this sort of. Yeah. But then again, that was all about social change over in Jamaica too. They were the yeah. lower scale of the society over there. Yeah, the well, I mean, that was, and that Trench that Town and. Like descendants of slaves, yeah. like from the from the British. So family. it's really bizarre how music, and it goes right back to early blues. You know, the African slaves coming over, or yep. the Appalachian. Yeah, you know, hillbilly, right, real redneck hip hop. Well, like, exactly. You know, yeah, like straight hip hop of... used to be like, you know, African American music. Now it's now but, you've got these like white boys with coloured hair and multicoloured teeth and and face tats. Yeah, but again, that that, that whole two pack. Biggie Smalls, you know, gang, uh, whatever it was. There was billions of dollars being made. Yep. But the music that was being created was actually saying something about society. So I didn't grow up in Crompton or Venice or yep. wherever, you know, where there was a, you but, know, you, you had three jobs and you still weren't making it above the... it kind of changed from being politically charged a la public enemy to being like, yeah, this is about our lives in the ghetto well, yeah, type but, thing. You know, Vanilla Rice sampled Queen, yep. um, MC Hammer... They were global hits on a scale that left the ABBA behind. Oh, the, MC know. Hammer sampled uh, Rick James. Oh, was it? Funky oh, Drummer or something? Or James Brown? No, or... no, no, no. She's hey. a very funky girl. Da, da. Yeah, yeah. Um... And it was catchy stuff. And admittedly, um, super freak at her. But I think you played oh, a couple of weeks ago. I think you sampled something, the Funky Drummer, that James Brown riffed. Yep. And then you went back to an old blues singer, Thayla Thorpe or someone? Oh, Rosetta Tharp. Ah, yeah. Sister yeah, Rosetta yeah. Tharp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's kind of considered the godmother of um, rock and roll, basically. So, well, exactly. You know, the Stones K, they were a blues band. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Eric Clapton. Rhythm of Fear. Oh, Richard. Yeah, the Who? Clapton. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. those old Who with the marquee, yeah, maximum yeah. R&B? Yeah, well, they were mods too, you know, yeah. with the bloody uh, arrows and the dartboards on their shirts. Hey, let's leave music. You travelled. You travelled in the late 70s, uh, early 80s? Yeah. Left uh, late 79, came back late, oh, early 81. Okay, so at this point in time, a lot of the surfers that were here in Australia were venturing off to Asia. Southeast yeah, a lot, Asia. a lot longer before that too. Yeah. Um, I was very well, well. I had mates that left in. Well, I had a mate. Bob passed away. They got me into the pistol, uh, the Velvet Underground, and Zapper and, and the Bob Dylan. He, when we were in four form, he went to uh, Java in his school holidays. Oh, wow! And got malaria. Okay. <laughs> but he went for um, certain plants, and animals. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of people that you read about, like the earlier guys, Kim Bradley and Morney the Earth type people. Yeah, um, now that was... Steve uh, Cooney Steve and... Steve Cooney and... Um, oh, who was the other one? And that soundtrack, Morning of the Earth, you know, that, that yeah. was just global. And the same with Rodriguez, you know, the surfing community. I don't rem- remember him, Cold Fact and Coming From Reality. Yeah, yeah, I gave you... I, didn't I give you that movie, Searching for yeah, Sugarman? Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the South African surfers got onto him. Okay. And again, it was hand, it was a record that was handed around, and yeah. that's when tapes came in, you know, so people were taping it. Yep. Rodriguez wasn't getting any uh, royalties or whatever. Yep. But there's a thousand artists like that, you know, that their music finds a niche in a certain area, be it surfers or artists or whatever it may be, and it never makes millions, but like that Rodriguez guy, he was very, very happy. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's why I was so glad the Pistols reformed. No, yeah, fil- I, went and saw him. I went and saw him on the fi- Filthy Lucre tour. Yeah. And it was just I like, thought that was just, it was the whole concept, the whole yeah. ethos of punk well, was I to mean, make a buck. We, we, like, let's go and see the Pistols. We got there, like, after the first song and we paid 30 bucks for three of us to get in off a scalper. Yeah. Like, it was like... What, 30 bucks at all? Or yeah, 30 30, bucks 10 bucks each. each. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well. Actually, I think it might have been 40 <laughs> bucks. They didn't make any th- th- filthy lucre tickets, out of yeah. 40 bucks. Yeah, okay. So he was keen to get rid of them. But, like, it was great to see Steve Jones... Like playing and they had in front of a stack of Glenn Marshall Matlock. amps. Yeah, yeah, Glenn Mac- Matlock so playing Steve bass. Jones, Paul Cook, Johnny. Yeah, yeah. Hang on, but hang on. Let's get back to Asia and travelling. Oh, let's sorry, yeah, we wobble. Okay, so so you left you left Australia late seventy nine with your friends who will remain lameless. Ah, uh, yeah, but you still know <laughs> one of them. Yeah, and he's still here today, and he's yep. done a lot for me, and vice versa. And also, uh, there used to be a surf shop just down here in town near the bank. Um, and the girl that married that gentleman there was the sister of the bloke I went overseas oh, with. Okay, okay. So they okay. lived in a very nice house in Jeroot Park in and Cronulla, and we all worked at Cronulla RSL, saved up our money, and hit the north. Hit the north. Uh, and you landed? Um, Penang? Penang. Yeah, caught the ferry. Uh, no, wait a minute. Kuala Lumpur. Cool. Caught the ferry over to Penang. Yep. Uh, the, one of the guys I was travelling had been there before, knew the Losman. We were buying our uh, little bullets off the local police chief. And I uh, uh, still had the boards. Then this was the time. This was the time when the golden tri- triangle was glowing golden. Oh yeah! Forget okay. about the kids up in Chiang Rai that were stuck in the cave, Chiang Mai, and north of Chiang Rai, Burma. Yep. Um, the Black Lahu and the Shan. They were all opium growers. They had machine guns, Tupperware. And that was it. Machine gun. Oh, Actually, no, yeah, yep. you told me when you went to the family and they had it was Tupperware. <laughs> and machine guns. Yeah, and machine. opium. <laughs> Crikey's. So how long so, were you away for? Well, I did a lot of non-surfing activities with Kim and yep. Drew because Kim was surfing, but Drew, oh, anyway. Yep. Um, and then a friend of ours came over from Cronulla that we worked with at the RSL and she was gorgeous. Yep. So they all thought we were a... Hawking around on the street. Oh God! Uh, so then I had my passport stolen, yep. and I had to leave my two mates. So I went down. So you to, had your passport stolen in uh, Tanjong Bunga, which is a little beach suburb of Penang. Uh, so and, Penang's sorry. an island off the east coast of Malaysia. Okay. Uh, and they thought I'd sold it for. Um, so this is the Australian consul or whatever mm, thought you'd sold it to get yeah, money to buy. Yeah. Okay. So about a fortnight later, they found my passport abandoned in the street at Tanjong Bunga. <laughs> <laughs> and I've still got it. And there was a little ad in the Penang Star. And before I went overseas, my mother said, Bruce, don't get in the Australian papers. Like, it was just after. What's more deadlier than the Australian uh, Redback, the Malaysian Trapdoor? <laughs> Arlo and Chambers, all that jazz, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, I hadn't used in years, but okay. it was still, 
that's what you went to. It was either surf or... And there was a lot of people from Australia going over there and basically oh, going sure. on drug benders. Oh, yeah, yeah, but also making a lot of money out of, you know, smuggling stuff. Oh, OK. Well, it was before Seven Eleven, so you could send anything back to Australia through the post. And I never did this because that's before called fraud. Before Seven Eleven. The, oh, well, you know, when the Trade Towers went, not 7 Oh, 9 11. McDonald's, yeah, sorry. I thought, like, before 7 11 shops got, exist. I've got the convenience stores mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're mixing up your convenience stores with. Uh, yeah, actually, it was Hungry Jacks. Yeah, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. When they blew up Burger Hungry King. Jacks. It's 7 Eleven. Oh, dear, the age yeah. is creeping in. Yeah. Um, so then after that, uh, the, the other two guys I was travelling with left. Yeah. Uh, one bloke had got his girlfriend up the duff and was in love, and the other chap had had a gut full of travelling with me, I think. Um, so I hit the track. I went back to Sumatra, all the way down to Java and Bali, surfing, yep. and spent about three months down there. But mainly, it's just the, you know, Bali, when I went to Bali, it was like a one-horse town. Yeah, right. And I, this was 1980, okay. so it was way before, uh, way after. Like they, people had been going to Bali, and so was there not that much pollution then? Like, nah, apparently no. it's really badly polluted now through Indonesia. Yeah, but we did that. You know, you can blame yeah, yeah, surfers yeah. for a lot. of Surfers intrinsically are selfish people. Anyone that lives a lifestyle that is self gratifying like that, it is. It is. I'm well, a right jack. Fuck you. All you right. All you want to do is surf. Well, yeah. Which is, and so when I went overseas, yeah. being called what I am, people say, "Oh, well, you're Australian." Yeah, yeah. You know, what's Australia like? Oh, I don't know. I've been far north as Noosa and. Far yeah, south yeah. as Kira, uh, you know, Kayama. Yeah, yeah. So it is a very limiting, but I'm so glad I did it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so glad I was introduced to drugs because it really changed. I was a bank teller. I could yeah. still be, be a, uh, I could be a bank manager. Yeah, yeah. And looking at me now, I can see the look in your but, eye. But you it find is, that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a top, it's like it's a fine line to walk where you can, like one side is falling off on the side of, yeah, of, of dying if, if, and being completely fucked up. And then the other side is falling off, coming out that, like you could, you, you've, you've, you've come through this and, and you're a better person for it. And you've had experiences that you wouldn't have normally had oh, or sure, otherwise yeah. had. Or, and I'm not saying, but people like John Lydon and Dinner, you know, and admittedly he came from a lot worse situation, you know, blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Yep. So we were never poor. We had everything we could possibly desire, but it wasn't brand new, but we were fed, we were warm, we had shoes on our feet, you know. Yep. So when I broke out of that mould about what my parents and my sisters and brothers did, yep. brother did, um, I didn't want to do that, but I started doing it and becoming a bank person. And then through surfing and the way surfing changed, the more alternative version, your red setter and your combi. Yep. <coughs> red your... setter dog we're talking about. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I speak of, you know, everyone knows about red setters and combis. Yeah, it I sounds like an Amco was, ad from the seventies. When I was a little kid, we used to get scared of a red setter that would often be in the street in, on the on the route home. Where Dog on the street. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he he wasn't. He, he would he would chase us and bark, and we would freak out. Yeah. And it was like this mad. We we thought it was a massive dog. You know <laughs> well, what they I mean? were big we dogs, scared. and they were long eared little buggers. Yeah. So yeah, so I spent about four months, I suppose, going down from went from Malaysia to Singapore, Singapore to. Java, Sumatra, Bali, back up from Bali, back to Thailand. Yep. Oh no, back to a little island off the coast of Malaysia called Koh Samui. Okay. Which is a very popular spot now. Got a job there with a family that run a lodgement on the beach, uh, going into where the ferry came in, and trying to sucker people to come and stay at the the pe this people's place. It's King's Bungalow. Uh, then from there I went to Phuket. I was travelling by myself. Yep. So I'd left my board back in Penang, where the first place we stopped at. Yep. Then up into northern Thailand, Chiang Mai, Chiang uh, Phang. Yep. Illegally into Burma for the Tupperware. Now, yeah. Now that's now tell us the story of the Tupperware. Oh, it was just brilliant. Uh, one of the guys we a uh, uh, Thai guy. Yep. <coughs> that had uh, he was the drug dealer from yep. from the Lozman we were saying, and it wasn't even a Lozman; it was a brothel. Okay. <laughs> so he said, oh, look, I'm going, I oh, was some kind of wild cat, not, not like a panther, but like a panther, but a lot smaller. Yep. So every year at a certain time of the year, he used to go into Burma, southern Burma, and shoot these animals and skin them and sell the skins to someone. Yep. And also he'd pick up uh, jade and, and um, sapphires and things like that. Okay. Go so... On. 
it used to stay, there were certain tribes up there that were fighting the Burmese government, but they were all opium growers. So I think they were the, the Black Lahu and the Shan, okay. and they were, they were all traditional, beautiful, embroidered you know, skirts and stuff, and the men, beetle nut chewers, a machete and a lap lap. I tried beetle nut when I was in Sri Lanka. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. So you have it with lime wrapped in a leaf or something? Yeah, like it was... Oh, it's got I got release. it. I, I got it, and I, and I think I might have Googled how to use it. Oh, right, yeah. And, um, yeah, it just tasted... So you've got to chew it, and by yeah, the sucking it of it... tasted foul, yeah. and it just... Well, when you spit made it out, it's all... a little bit sick and made my mouth go oh, really, really red. But did you get a... Oh, uh, not really. Gee, it sounds like the time we tried nutmeg, or someone said it got us high. <laughs> yeah, I went down to the supermarket, Smoking bought a... banana peel. <laughs> no, mellow yellow. <laughs> yeah, but going into northern, um, well, northern Thailand, Burma, so these people were like the Stone Age, and they were all growing cabbages and opium. Cabbages. Well, cab- yeah. They had, like, really basic corn, maize, oh, okay, yeah. cabbages, but their major crop was opium. Yeah, right. And it was just in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, right. But there was, no one could speak a word. The guy that we were with could speak their language, and he'd yep. interpret to us. But there was four of us, and they it was like curse. They just made us feel like they'd give up their loss. And you were and, in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. In, in the middle like of the Like four days jungle. walk into some place, yeah, right. and every time you stopped... You'd ever just sleep out at a clearing or you'd go to a village. And when you went to a village, all the kids would say, oh. And I'm not saying it was like white men or, you know, going up the Congo or, you know. The, I mean, like I found in Sri Lanka the kids are still like that. In Vietnam the kids are still like that. They're just like. Yeah. Uh, the, and it's because they haven't got what we take for granted. Yeah, yeah. They haven't got a school. They haven't got medical care. They haven't got Lollies. TV. Yeah. Yeah. So... They entertain themselves with a crab or rolling a little stick down, the, you know, yep. like a, a broken bicycle. And that's five hours of... of fun. Yeah, but yeah. they've got that time. And I had that time as a kid, just to sit there with no outside influences yep. and just play in the dirt and torture worms and... Yeah. So, okay, so you've got, to, you've got to this village, you're staying with these people. Yeah. And the first thing they do at night after they... And food was just like rice and vegetables and maybe pig something like that okay but they you felt they, they made sure that they served you first and you were the center of attention like yep. you paid for it but it was a couple of i wasn't bart i don't can't remember i think it was ringat or something burmese currency i can't remember so you did pay for it but it was bugger all and they'd see you this beautiful em- embroidered clothing you know like okay. uh, vests and so shirts where does, so so where does the top like they oh well um we're all sitting around and once at night and the women usually go away and opium then was for old men and you know the infer you know infirm and, and all the whiteies that were coming well to, and they realized the that you know, people were doing that trail to get zongoed yep so, you know, the opium would come out and they'd prepare a pipe for you and they'd have a, you know, like a proper opium pill and vert it. You'd sit down on a little wooden block. Yep. And they'd get a really long, like, needle and they'd get the, it looked like a little rice bubble. Yep. They'd burn it over a flame, a little lamp, and then when it went malleable, sort of like plasticine, yep. they'd get it on a pin and force it into the cone of the opium pipe and invert the cone over a candle or a flame. Yep. And then slowly you'd inhale it. And within, like, probably a minute, I've inhaling probably four times. It was good night, Vienna. So they kept their opium in a Tupperware container? Well, no, but that's all they had. They had submachine guns, M16s or something, <laughs> and they didn't have Coca-Cola. They didn't have... But they had Tupperware. Did they have, like... like to say, did they have, like, uh, axe? Oh, they, yeah, they yeah. had that. Okay. But the only modern the thing were, okay, like, yeah. machine guns, like guns to probably protect their crops. Yep. Oh, and, yeah. and plastic and, cooking. And Tupperware. No, but storage. they kept all their grains and things. Like they had a really oh, vast... Okay. It was like someone had shown up from Tupperware and knocked on the door and said, hey, how about a Tupperware the party? the thing for you guys. And it was. <laughs> they thought it was just bloody brilliant. So it was like the Mormons, you know, spreading their religion, except it was Tupperware. <laughs> and I thought... I was that out of it. I thought, well, how does this... Um, how does this join together? Here we are in the middle of nowhere in Burma... And Burma during that period was pretty wild as far as their government and, uh, you know, the Buddhist monks were revolting and the, the insurgents were the Black Lahu. They were fighting for uh, independence from Laos and Vietnam and um, Cambodia and Thailand all wanted to strip their timber and their minerals. Yep. So these guys were really pissed off, but they realised this was a form of cold currency 
that they could buy Tupperware and some machine guns with, <laughs> because apart from opium, that, that was their only yeah. cash crop. Yeah. Look, I mean, that's. I think that's sort of the thing with the, the whole third world. And um, I was watching a Strain Hunters um, video, which is the guys from one of the big seed banks, cannabis seed banks in oh, Amsterdam. Right, yeah. And he's like, you know, this they're, they're in the middle of nowhere. They've they're, they're tracking down some land, land race strain of Canada that's specific to that con- uh, cannabis that's um, hey. specific to that country. And then um, one of the guys who's just recently died, actually, in the last 12, 12 two years, twelve was, months. Was he a native guy? I think he, I think he died of malaria as well, or oh, something yeah, like that. Yeah. He um he was like, you know, this is in a lot of ways this is kind of wrong because like the such a vast part of the third world relies on growing drugs, whether it be poppies, yeah, but, cannabis, yeah. coca. But before before like, the Western world got involved, that cannabis has been around and opium and yeah, heroin has been but around. But this thing that's been able to enable these people to actually mm. um, step like step out of their yeah, sub sub yeah. what, what is it um, subsistence subsistence yeah. life and to actually be able to yeah like. Well, Stockpile that's some money yeah. and buy buy stuff as well, rather well, than just sort when of. When I first exchanged, right. I was travelling with American dollars, you know, and I got a couple of thousand baht in Thailand. Yeah, got a couple of thousand rupee in Indo or wherever it was, you know. Yep. And then you were saying that time you were in Vietnam and the the little cash machine was rickety, and you thought, yeah. oh yeah, I'll get my money out here and I'll do it on the computer. And then you went back to your motel and had a Bob Marley or whatever. And um, you thought, well, hang on a second. I wonder if that was kosher and yeah. rang your bank and all. So, yeah, by – and you can say this right back to how we rooted Bali, how we've rooted a lot of serving destinations. Like and, I, when, and when Bruce says rooted Bali, what what we basically mean is the <laughs> Westerners have fucked Bali. Well, for sure. <sighs> like, but, you know, Bali's been on the map since the 30s or yeah. way, you know, oh, the artist colonies man, or like, whatever. You see some of these early – like and again, YouTube. I don't want, don't like to mention it too much, but it is a platform that I'm on for sure. Um, it, like there's, there's, there's footage of Bali in the early 20th century, and it's just like wow, mm. heaven on wow. It. But yeah. that's what Hawaii was like. That's yeah. what the Pacific's still like. Yep. Yep. So again, it goes back to what we find and cherish as our own little place of Nirvana, be it music or a lifestyle or surfing. We end up rooting because. Word gets out, yeah. and you can say the same about Yamba or Byron uh, yeah, or anywhere. Any small, yeah. Now, what was it that you said about when we go to Asia? You said it to me before I went to Sri Lanka. I think we we go to Asia and we. Oh, we're ter- Australians are terrible. We've got no idea. No, but like the, the the mental space that you're in when you go to a country like this, how you how you drop down or you drop oh, you, all you your get, yeah, you, pres- you you drop your ego, yeah. and not the ego I. I you, no, you still dress well. You wear the sarong when in Rome to us Rome, yep. Romans. But it's so far removed from going to Woolworths or going, yeah. and we didn't have we didn't have McDonald's when I grew up. Yeah, you drop the ego. Exist. You drop the ego of your sort of existence in Western culture, where it's sort of all based on all the stuff that you've got and and the house that yeah. you live in, and you go into this environment where people live in like a. But it happened. A two by two meter room, yeah. and there's four of them in there, and they and don't they have anything. And they invite you in. And that, yeah. It happened to me like a dozen times, be it in Burma or in yeah. Singapore, where you meet people, they say, come home. And they don't make you come home so they can see your paintings or your sister or rip you off. Yeah. They come home because they want to practice their English or that you're yeah. something different. Yeah. So we were in the middle of Singapore, you know. We were chasing the dragon in the local cemetery. Went back to these people's places. There was their grandmother, their four kids and mum and dad in a two-bedroom unit in a multi-high-rise in the middle <laughs> of Singapore. And the, the bloke could speak English, but none of the his wife and his kids couldn't and his grandma. And the only thing we had in common was ABBA songs. And we sat there all night singing Mamma Mia. <laughs> and it was just brilliant, man. And then they kicked the grandma out of... She slept with the grandchildren and the married couple had their room. And they kicked the grandma and the kids out into the lounge room kitchen. So Drew, uh, not Drew, uh, the guy I was travelling with, yep. Tommy was Dutch. We could have their room. <laughs> yeah. And they were so happy with nothing. Yeah. And the same in Burma. Yeah. They always had a smile on their face, always offering you something, not because they wanted your money. Yeah. Is that they were so pleased to see someone that represented the Western world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? 
and you didn't have your $2,000 watch on or your camera, no. you're walking around your raggedy sarong. And, and I'm not saying we went feral, but my oath we did, you know. <laughs> <laughs> went in Rome. But I remember, you know, like when we were travelling up through northern Thailand and a man's sarong is a longi and they're yeah. very plain. They're like tea towel, you know, yeah, like yeah, tablecloths, yeah, yeah. yeah. So me and this guy are sitting there, and the other bloke's got his leg light, and we've got these beautiful uh, sarongs on all hibiscuses and beautiful <laughs> colours, and everyone in the carriage is laughing at us, you know. <coughs> and the ticket guy comes down, and he could speak a bit of English, and there was these two Muslim girls sitting opposite us, you know, with the whole shabab. And no drama, you know, like yeah. the, the call at night, like it's a beautiful sound. In Malaysia's a really, yeah, yeah. Um, but this was in Thailand. But my mate had his foot up and no undies, and his wedding tackle was hanging out. And these poor two Muslim girls across <laughs> oh the seat God. from us, <laughs> like were, you know, on the other side of the carriage, but looking up. Yeah. And the poor old conductor had English, but he didn't have enough English to say, hey, mate, you And we thought <laughs> nothing out of on it. The train. Yeah. And then you'd walk through a compound, you know, on the way to somewhere in your woman's skirt, basically, <laughs> and you thought you were the coolest thing since sliced bread because you had this beautiful sarong and you had a good tan, you had hair. Mm, but and, it's a girl sarong. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, you know, and I know it's a lot cooler now to walk down the middle of the main drag with the dress on. But to them, it was these crazy white people that think they're so hip. Yeah. But they're so understanding because maybe you do bring a little money to their economy or yeah, yeah. they can learn a bit of English off you. But you learn more from them if you lower yeah. your um, Western expectations. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, when I was in Sri Lanka, I'd be looking for hotels and people, I'd be looking, reading reviews on TripAdvisor or whatever and people would be, oh, there was a bug <laughs> in the... <laughs> There was a bug in the toilet, and, and I'm just... Oh, you had to like, squat and have a crap. Like you're in the third world. Like, yeah, what do you what expect? Do you expect? Like, <laughs> but I remember you were saying in places where, um, I think it was either Vietnam or Cambodia, where there was a lot of fat Western men. Yeah, well, I mean, that kind of turned, that kind of turned me off. But, oh, it's the same. But I didn't realise, you know, the majority of pla cheap places we stayed in were basically brothels. Yeah. And I'm not stupid, but... I don't know, you know. I, I well, I mean, uh, even like last year when I was staying in Vietnam, they had one of their rooms was a dedicated short stay room. Oh, right, short time. Yeah. <laughs> but you've got to sell what you've got. Yeah. You know, and it's the oldest profession on God's earth. Yeah. But, and it's all over the world, down the sex trade and, and that thing there, you know. And as Midnight all said, you're either part of the solution or you're part oh, of the problem. Did they say that? I think so. Huh. Better die on your feet than to live on your knees. Yeah, I don't. But, know I mean, said like, it. regardless of who said it, you are either part of the solution or part of the pollution. But it's it's a lot better to come home and realise that that's how the majority of the world lives, especially in Asia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's what's happening I, I find it embarrassing. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I I'm not a rich person in this country, but if I go to Vietnam or I go to Sri Lanka, I, I am a rich person, no, and, it, sure. and it's embarrassing yeah. to. To have but to say we, no to people because, because like you need, you, you need you need what they spend what oh. the, what they spend on, on on food for a week you need that for your train fare from the station from from the from the airport yeah. to, to well for me but, from, from the them, airport to my mum's house like yeah. it's just yeah so just, what you go down to the bottle shop and spend on a carton of beer thirty Australian forty Australian dollars over there oh. is a month's yeah or my, I, but they're happy. I don't know if they're happy because they're forced to be happy or they've got to a stage where they've realised that material, if you're fed, you're sa and are they safe? Are they fed? But they've got a whole different concept of they keep their family close to them. They've yeah. got – and the joy that you see in the kids and, and the people. Yep. And it doesn't just translate to them being friendly to you. They're, they're of a different headspace. They're not – cultivating a friendship to see what they can get out of it they're cultivating yeah. a friendship because we're human beings and yeah. we need communication between human beings but that's why we're that's why we are go, that's why we go there as well to, like, oh, to, to see to a different world like, to but we know we can come home to yeah. a safe european home yeah you know? but and that's what embarrasses me it's like oh god I, but I, doesn't like, I felt, doesn't i, I Aussie, feel like Aussie, Aussie embarrass you doesn't the cronulla rights embarrass yeah, oh, you? yeah doesn't... like totally uh, like totally uh, you know i go there and i feel like I need to live in a place like this for some period of time in my life. Like, but wouldn't wouldn't you just done what most people have done? Like I've I heard of a mate that 
who's a Seventh Day Adventist, and he put us up in Tassie. Yep. Lovely guy, Dutch bloke. But he's now in Cambodia, married to a Cambodian wife. He's yep. in his late, early 70s. Yep. And, you know, I don't not say it, but his wife's like 22. Jesus. And he's providing a good life, and he's treating it correctly, and he's doing, yep. he's, start, he's built schools, and he's yeah, involved yeah, yeah. in the good yeah, side yeah. Oh, of look, yeah, absolutely. white man in... Um, the Hammersmith Odeon. Yeah, look, I mean, it's a t- it's a tough one. Uh, like, I f- I found it pretty disturbing, I, and I've said to a few people, like Cambodia, I saw guys old enough to be my dad, w- yeah, with, with women young enough to be my daughter. Mm. Um, and I, I found I found it extremely disturbing. But you know, at the end of the day, these these countries will will get past this period in their, oh, for sure. in their history. Yeah. Um, well, you look people, how China's developed in India. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, Sri Lanka, like Sri Lanka, uh, and and even Vietnam, mate. Like, Vietnam, there's so much high rise in, in Vietnam. There's so much high rise, like foreign money being invested but in, in Sri Lanka. Isn't it funny we get to that stage where we've got all the skyscrapers and the coal power and the mobile phone and the TV and the level lounge suite, and we're dissatisfied. We're killing our yeah. environment. And the reason I went overseas was to see a simpler life. You know. Yep. Yep. And that was tied in with the era I grew up in surfing and also recreational Bob Marley use. Yep. But again, it was very selfish on my part. I didn't want to live in the current Australia because I found it boring and stifling. Yeah, I mean, I... But I could come home and get a job. Yeah. Look, I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, I I do definitely sort of spend time when I'm on there thinking, oh, I'm, I'm so privileged. I'm, I'm privileged. Like, who am I to... Who am I to judge this person that's hassling me, hassling me to yeah, get in their, their, yeah. their tuk-tuk? It's like I, I don't have to live. I don't have to live in this level with this level of desperation to make mm. an income to feed so my family. So what we spend at the drive-through at McDonald's, that guy pulling you around the streets of you know Cambodia or Vietnam, is yeah. supporting fifteen people. Yeah, yeah. It's but and it, I mean, there's this catch twenty-two. It's like, well, so do I give these? people hardly anything compared to what I give to them in Australia or do I give them a a little bit less than what I would give somebody to do the same job in Australia Um, for the service that they're giving you whether it be riding around on your cyclo taking you for a tour on the back of their scooter or whatever the case may be Um, but But I'm sure they realise what they're doing maybe taking you out to the temple or whatever or taking you down to the local shop whatever they may be doing for them, it's food on the table and paying yeah. rent or whatever it is. But they must connect with the fact that they're in the tourism trade. And the person that wor- you know worries about the yeah. bug in the bathroom is going to pay the price. She's not going to haggle. She's not going to say, well, hang on a minute, mate. Yesterday, when the other bloke took me from so-and-so to so and so it's only 100 yeah. rupee or whatever it was. Yeah. And I, I still haggle. And when you got your camera yesterday, yeah, y- you've got to manipulate. And that, again, is... Is self not self greed? It's preservation of yourself. Whereas yeah. over there, of course, you've got to preserve this, but it's on a whole prehistoric level. There's yeah, no yeah. But dole. There's no charity. It's like though, um, and I've got the vibe in Cambodia, in Sri Lanka, in in, in Vietnam, and and who knows where I'm going to visit this year in in, in Asia. Yeah, but you cycled but around Sri Lanka, didn't you? They are. They're countries that are developing, whereas like our country and a lot of the rest of Western, a lot of the rest of the Western yeah, world the seems like the wrong end of it. Well, it seems like we've developed and now we're starting to rot. Loot. It, it's like a, like an apple on a tree, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, but we still want more. Yeah. Um, so again, but you can't deny um, um, undeveloped countries, fresh water, sewerage, no. hot and cold water. You can't deny you can't deny them wanting to come here. No, like, of course I, not. Like, I entirely understand why people would want to come oh. here, and I totally sympathise with. Yeah, and with it them doesn't and have I, to be fleeing and I w- a war. I would welcome or... them if, if they have the motivation to, and the and the balls to get yeah. on a leaky boat. And, and I think the, the, the big reason for racism in Australia is because we still haven't come to grips with what we did with our First Nation people. No. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah so again, you know, or the and if it wasn't for the Vietnam War and the Vietnamese people that came over during that. Yep. Or go right back to you know the war in Malaysia, a communist threat through all through yep. Indonesia, and then we sit around and say, well, if you weren't born here, don't come here. If you flew here, don't come here. 
How do we get here? <laughs> <I know. laughs> and that's that's a very um, existential question. Well, no, it's also a very trendy thing to be involved in now. Yeah. You know who killed Tuganini? You know, go to Green Point, you know, and you look about the history of this area. Yeah. And the Northern Rivers. Yeah, yeah. And then you see, you know, um, the condition of some of the indigenous people in our area. Yep. It's shocking, but we, yeah. we you know, we just don't get it. Yeah. And I'm not saying I do anything about it. I just sit at a radio station and talk about it. <laughs> well, I reckon we've been going. Yeah, we've been going for an hour and a half, so we might um, wrap it up. Thanks. Yeah. For, well, thanks my for... chip's about to expire. Hop to it, <laughs> Jaime. Thanks for thanks for coming here, Bruce. And, That's a right, Stewie. And chatting and um, yeah, hopefully I'll make you famous on the internet. I'm already famous, not on the internet. <laughs> I'm a legend in my own lifetime. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun, mate. Thanks very much. Hey, thank you. All right, Get a haircut. See you guys. <laughs> <laughs>